then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise must not die too. So be it. Tell you about it and blow everybody away. So, you have one life to live. It's but a vapor in compare, comparance to eternity. How are you living your life? Father, we thank you and praise you for you are a most glorious God. Your name is high above all other names. We thank you, Lord. We come here today to praise you, to worship you, to learn your ways, to hear your words and apply them to our lives. Lord, I just pray that your spirit fill this place today, that your words not only go in our ears, but affect our hearts and our lives. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you have done, all that you will do, and we long for Jesus' return. We pray this in his name. Amen. So if you have one life, which you do, which everyone does, one life, that's it. Every decision you make, every choice you make, every thought you make, every action you have, God knows every single one. And they have consequences. And He has called you to be holy. If you're reading your Bible, if you are, and, I, and if you haven't noticed the pattern here, I'm asking you every week. And I'm preaching over what you should have read this week. But I doubt very seriously every one of you is reading along with me. And I bet if I asked you, I bet you some of you have fallen along the wayside. We should all be reading God's Word, studying, coming together. We are one body united by the Spirit of God Himself to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this world. I could stop there. That's enough. But I want to continue to talk to you about what we read this week so that hopefully it will mean more. So hopefully you'll hunger more. You'll get a taste of it. You'll say, hey, we had some ribs this week and they were good. Next week we had some steak and it was good. I'm a meat eater. Next week we had some, some fried chicken and it was good, except fried food has a little bit of afterbite on me. But anyway, you get my point that we hunger for God's Word. We eat it and read it together. We feed upon it. We hunger and thirst for righteousness because we have one life to live and it's but a vapor and then it's gone. Think about that. When it's a cold day out and the humidity's high and you see your breath come out of your mouth, it's there for a second and it's gone. You can't find it anymore. You can't ch chase it. You can't bring it back. It's gone. And you should have read Ecclesiastes this week. You should have read some more of 1 Kings and you saw that, wait a minute, what is Solomon doing here? He, he knows all these things. He asked for wisdom and God gave him wisdom and honor and wealth above anybody else. And what is he doing with it? But he's chasing the things of this world and not fearing and loving the Lord. What is he doing? And as you read on this upcoming week, you're going to see that the kingdom is divided and put in half. You saw this week, if you read, that God Himself raised up adversaries against Solomon because he didn't follow in the ways of David. And then you think about that, and you say, David, really? <laughs> David, who did all these sins? But when he did, he realized it, and he got himself out of the mud. Remember that story out of the pig slop? And dusted himself off and said, I'm going to return to my father. And that's what he did. Yeah, David is a man who did some terrible things, but he's a man after God's own heart. But on his deathbed, he taught Solomon to murder instead. Mm. From two weeks ago, we read this, Proverbs 1, 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but, on the contrary, there's two choices here. 
Fools, instead of wise, fools despise wisdom and instruction. The beginning of your path through life, when you get an understanding, when you're able to process and think thoughts of your own, if you wonder what Kara was doing in here, she's processing and thinking her thoughts of her own. She had to go pee-pee. And she needed someone to help her. And Lena wasn't it. <laughs> or Lena wasn't it. She wanted somebody familiar with her. So we went and pottied success. She's wearing real underwear today. Remember that day when you had that day? I was reminded of that this week when we were trying to train Willow and there was a little accident in your lap, Barry. Remember that day? <laughs> when you start to learn, you realize that this life is not your own. It's but a vapor. It is the gift of God. You were created in His image. You were created for His purpose, for His will, period. But yet we sinned. We live in this world that is meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Because the things of this world don't matter. But when we see, get to that conclusion of Ecclesiastes, we'll see that something does matter. It's how we live this life. If we live it in fear of God and obedience to His command, or if we don't. And if we're training up our children to do the same. And if the world is seeing our behavior and we're drawing them to Jesus Christ rather than scattering them. Because Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. It's a but situation. It's black or white. It's one or the other. You either love God or you don't. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8 said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, and all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Here's what you need to do. Fear the Lord and shun evil or sin. And then we get a promise on top of that. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. If you read on, you'll read this in verse 11 of chapter 3. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. What good father does not discipline his children when they're not acting the way they're supposed to? Why do we discipline our children? To correct their behavior and because we love them and want to protect them and want the best things for them. They might not understand it at that time, but hopefully one day they'll come to the recollection where they understand that. That the father's ways are best. Ha, ha, ha. Have you figured that out yet with your heavenly Father? That His ways are best and they lead to life? Eternal life. Verse 11 of Proverbs 3, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent His rebuke because the Lord disciplined those He loves. As a father, the son he delights in, not just loves, but delights and finds pleasure in. Because he knows that that correction will lead to obedience and to life. As you read on in Proverbs 8, verse 13, it says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. So the more that you grow and the more that you mature, the more that sin becomes foreign to you. The more that instead of you looking at this and say, hey, should I do this? I know that it's wrong. We'll just use an example that I've had problems with for lust. Should I look at this woman with lust or should it be as foreign to me as this isn't lustful? I have no desire to want to have sex with this. <laughs> it's foreign, exactly. That sounds stupid, doesn't it? Because it's foreign. Because you should hate sin and it should be something that is foreign from you. Was it to Jesus? Didn't he not Sin? Hmm. And then he expounded upon the law and he said, it, murder doesn't mean that you murder somebody. If you thought evil in your heart, you're guilty of it. And all have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard, don't we? We deserve death. We deserve rain every day. Oh, we don't even deserve rain, do we? We don't deserve oxygen to breathe every day. We sinned against God Almighty. But yet He still loves us. He still brings rain. He still brings sunshine. 
He gives it all to those who love and fear Him and to those that don't. But one day, Jesus Christ will return and claim His own, those who do love Him, who have put their faith and their trust in Him, who fix their eyes on Him and follow in His footsteps. From last week, you read Proverbs 28. I think that's where Jacob quoted from, right? 28? Proverbs 28, 14 says, Blessed is the one who always trembles before God, but whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. How many times have you heard God calling you, speaking to you? Maybe it was a burning bush, maybe it wasn't. But that you needed to do this and you've hardened your heart instead. Said, no, I'm not going to go talk to that guy. He offended me. No way am I going to go make reconciliation with him. Are you not hardening your heart? How many times have you sat in service and and heard, maybe I should be kind about this or do this or be giving about this, but I don't have enough finances. I don't have enough time. I will one day. I believe that's called hardening your heart. But whoever hardens their heart falls into trouble. If you read on in the New Testament, we'll get there eventually you'll see that Peter and Paul and James say, the reason that you're sick and the reason that some of you have died is because you're not following in the footsteps of your Lord. Your faith is not what you call it to be. You say one thing, but you do another. And if you don't think that even more, read about the first church in Acts. What happened by chapter 5? God struck the hypocrites dead in the church. He gave them every opportunity to speak the truth, but he struck them dead. And then if you read on, fear gripped the church and their behavior changed and the church grew. Hmm. Disciplining a child, leading him to corrective behavior so that he can see that the Father's ways are best. And then the end of Proverbs 31, we get to see that this is a family thing. This isn't just a man thing or a woman thing or a children thing. This is God's plan for families, for marriage, for children, for life. Chapter 31, verse 30, charm is deceptive, beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Praised, given glory and honor. Wow. But do we really need to fear God? Do we really? Jesus has came. Do we really need to fear God now? The church, today a lot of churches teach that we don't need to fear God anymore because perfect love casts out all fear. I've already told you that. The verse prior to that though says not to sin and in this world you're to be like Jesus. So that fear of God keeps you on the straight and narrow path. Let me give you a couple examples though. How about Abraham? Do you remember him? The father of our faith? What did he do when, he, when God said, hey, I'm going to give you a child, and it took forever in his timing to give him a child. And then he said, and you know all the mistakes leading up to that. <laughs> and then he said, go sacrifice him. Kill him for me. What? Uh, I don't know about that one. I think we need to disobey that one, right? No, we need to obey God no matter what the cost. He's the giver of life in the first place. His ways are, are wise. And in the more that we understand him, We know that since his ways are higher than ours, he won't just take my son's life and not be in control of his soul for all eternity. Maybe you've experienced heartache because you've lost a child or whatever else there is. God is in complete control and put your faith and trust in him and in all ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Do not lean into your own understanding. Because it's foolish. Were we there when he hung the stars in the heaven? No, we weren't. Do we command the rain or the sun to shine? No, we don't. So Abraham, Genesis chapter 22, verse 12. Here's what God said. Do not lay a hand on the boy. (laughs) He had faith in him and this is what happened as a result. He said, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. That fear is what started Abraham's path to righteousness. Because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Now you know what else that rings loud and clear? (laughs) God loved us enough that he gave his only son. 
Wow, see how much God loves you? What about Joseph? Do you remember him? His life just continued to get from bad to worse to worse to worse. But eventually he became second in command of Pharaoh, right? But boy, that was a hard road getting there. And then his brothers came to buy grain from him. What irony in that. And he had the power to take his revenge. What would have been wrong with it? I mean, they sold him off as dead. But here's what it says in Genesis 42, verses 17 to 18. They, he put them all in custody for three days. So he gave them a little taste, but he didn't do anything wrong. Verse 18, on the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. That fear of God governed his behavior, where he could walk the straight and narrow path even when he was tempted, even when he was in jail, even when he feared his life, even when he thought he was forgotten in prison. He walked by fear of God, trusting in Him, acknowledging God's ways and letting God direct his path. What about Sephora and Pua? Do you know who they are? Come on, I got $20 in my pocket for anybody that knows them. <laughs> you don't have a clue, do you? That's okay. We read about them in Exodus. They were Hebrew midwives. Hmm. They were told to kill all the baby boys of the Hebrews. But they didn't because they feared God. More than they feared man killing them for not doing what man said. And in this 1, 15 to 17, the king of Egypt, this new pharaoh that didn't know about Joseph, who did not fear the Lord, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sephora and Pua, I don't know if I pronounced that right or not, when you are helping the Hebrew women during children on the delivery stool, if you see that a baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Do you see a pattern here? Do you see what we're leading up to in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes? Do you see a pattern that the wisest fool who ever lived did not follow his own words? But he's written those words down for us now, and we have his life to learn from. Fearing the Lord above all things. If you read down in verse 21, here's a cool thing, because God always blesses those. Don't you bless your children who are obedient? Don't you give them good gifts? Hmm. Verse 21, And because the midwives feared God, not for any other reason, but because they feared God, God gave them families of their own, a heritage and a blessing from the Lord. What your name will live on, the real things that mean things in this world, your family, your children. These other things don't mean anything. They're like chasing after the wind. And even your wives and your children are all because God gave them the breath of life in the first place. And He honored you with them. What a responsibility we have to honor Him with them. So what does God's law say exactly about fearing Him? In Exodus 20, you know that chapter, right? The Ten Commandments, right? We get to number 10 in verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or, or his male or female servant his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Thou shalt not covet, right? Because then I realize that it's all about me rather than all being about God. <laughs> My life in general. Mine, Allen's. Verse 18. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountains and smoke, they trembled with fear. Do you realize that the Son of God who died you gave His life for you to give you life abundantly here on this earth and forevermore he will return and it will be with fire and judgment if you think they trembled then at the mountain think about what that day will be for those that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior they stayed at a distance verse 19 and, Mo and said to Moses speak to us yourself and we will listen but do not have God speak to us or we will die Verse 20, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, irony there, because you don't have to fear the one 
that you love perfectly who perfectly loves you because it drives that fear of condemnation, eternal punishment out. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. If you're sinning, I said this a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, whenever it was, stop. Let the fear of God stop you from doing the sin that so easily entangles you and brings not nourishment to your body, but cancer, which leads to death, which tears you apart instead of builds you up. Don't build your foundation on anything other than Jesus Christ, the solid rock. If you read on in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, we see applications of that fear that because of this, I won't treat my neighbor this way and so forth. And in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 10, we read, Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb? What I was just talking about. When you trembled in fear that day? And when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me, fear me, as long as they live, nothing changes. The pattern doesn't change. The path is the same from beginning to end. Fear the Lord your God and obey Him. And we're going to re remember that because we're going to see this in the conclusion of the matter in, in a little bit. So that the fear of God will be with you. To, excuse me, I'm in the wrong one. Um, as long as you live in the land and may teach them to your children. So not only are you supposed to live that way, but you're supposed to teach this pattern to your children so that they teach it to their children, so that they teach it to their children, so that they may have life, so that they may have blessings instead of cursings. That's why Joshua says, Choose you this day what is desirable. But as for me and my house, not just me, but me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua takes over and he teaches his children. And in Joshua 4, chapter 21 to 24, chapter 4, verse 21 to 24, he teaches us more about this fearing, this trusting and obeying, this path that we're supposed to follow. He said to the Israelites, in the future when your descendants ask their parents, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until, until you had crossed over. Because they seem to have forgot that generation that crossed the Red Sea, right? And the Egyptian army, including Pharaoh, who thought he was God, was destroyed before their very eyes. <clears throat> Verse 23, For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what He had done to the Red Sea when He dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth, not just your children, but all would see and know who God is, that they might know the hand of the, that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God forever ever, ever. Do you see the pattern? Or do I need to keep on? Because I can. <laughs> the pattern is there. It hasn't changed when Jesus Christ came on the scene. In fact, Jesus Christ showed us exactly how to live that. Because even though He was God in the flesh, He still obeyed His heavenly Father. Now we got Solomon, Solomon, Solomon. Hevel, hevel, hevel. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Vanity, vanity, vanity. Whatever you want to say. We have Solomon, Solomon, Solomon. In the third chapter of Kings, God appears to Solomon and says, Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. Did you get that part? Some of you are like, no. The younger people did. David's looking at me like I'm stupid. <laughs> what do you really want? And Solomon's prayer was so fabulous. Go back and read it again if you haven't. He says, who am I? How can I lead these people? Give me wisdom that I may lead your people. And we've got his words. <laughs> and even by a bad example, he can lead us because we see his mistakes. We can learn from those mistakes. But he asked for wisdom. So the scripture says that, he, that God was pleased and not only gave him wisdom, but he gave him wealth and honor far above anyone else who ever had. 
He was the man. He was the king. He had all authority, all power, and he had the wisdom to back it up. People from all over the world came. Remember the Queen of Sheba came. And they brought him gifts and continued to build the Lord's temple as well as his own because they continued to bring the gifts into to this country of Israel because their God was the true God. In 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 29 to 34, God gave. Don't forget this. God gave. In the beginning, God. At just the right time, God sent His only Son. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east. That's where the wisdom comes from, those wise men of the east. And greater than all the wisdom of Egypt, the ones who thought they were gods and set up their own gods. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan and Ezrite. Okay, we probably don't understand them, but they did. Okay, wiser than Heman, Kalko, and Darda, the sons of Maal. So he was wiser than Donald Trump or Obama all wrapped together. Or Oprah or whoever. Yeah, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs. There's not that many. There's only 31. This is a lot not recorded there. And not all of them are his. And his songs numbered 1,005. We don't have that many psalms either, do we? We've got 150, I think. 150, 151, right in there. He spoke about plant life from the, ce from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. He knew all about all these things. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. So he wasn't just educated in one area, everywhere. From all the nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world. Everywhere knew of Solomon. Why? so that they can learn about God, not Solomon. Because God is the reason for your breath, for your life, for your marriage, for your children, for everything that exists. And they heard about His wisdom. Then as you read on in 1 Kings 8, verse 22 says, Then Solomon st stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel. He spread out his hands towards heaven. Verse 23, And said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant, your covenant of love with your servants, who what? Continue wholeheartedly on your way, on that path of fearing, trusting, and obeying. Verse 36 even if these don't obey you. Will you do this, Lord? Verse 36, Hear from heaven and forgive the sins of your servant, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live. But that means you need to turn, doesn't it? What's that verse? If my people who are called by name will humble themselves before me, if they will... What is it all? Got it? There's like five elements. I'll try to do it from, from memory. But humble, turn... Pray, and, and then and He'll restore. We'll get it. We, we, I butchered it, but you understand. Go read it. Come back and tell me exactly what it said. It'll make my day. Okay? If His people will do that, because you have a choice to be wise or to be a fool. No middle ground. With Jesus or against Jesus. Let's read on. Verse 40. Why, would, why, did, why, why is all this going to happen? So that they will fear you. All the time they live in the land you gave your ancestors. Verse 43. When the foreigners come into the land, when they come seeking this great wisdom that you have, Solomon, because he doesn't hear his own words in his prayer, they will pray. Then God, hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the people of the earth may know your name and fear you. Too bad Solomon didn't follow his own words. If we keep reading in 1 Kings 9, now we're to the reading that you should have read this week. The Lord appeared to Solomon a second, second time. What was the first? What do you want? What do you really, really want? And he gave him wisdom because he had a good heart at that point. 
as he appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the, the, the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there as for you. And I'm making eye contact with every one of you because this applies to you just the same. If you walk before me faithfully with integrity of heart and uprightness as David your father did, there's your example, so you know he wasn't perfect, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws. See, there's a condition. Even with God's grace, it's free to all men, but you have to accept it. And just saying you accept it, that's not what Jesus said. He said, anyone who wants to be my disciple, they will deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after me. John 3, 16 says, For God so loves the world. But all of that prior to that says that a man must be born again. You have to come out of the darkness into the light. You have to decide, will you follow or not? Give you a couple other scriptures. These are spoiler alerts. We haven't got to these yet. You do know what a spoiler alert is, right? It means I'm giving something away. Just want to make sure. Hosea. You know what that book's about? God tells Hosea to go out and marry his prostitute wife because, see, that's the way Israel treated God and the way we treat God also. We commit adultery with other gods. We think of our own desires over His. We want my path instead of His path. My will instead of His will. In Hosea 2.23 I will plant her for myself in the land. I will show my love to the one I, one I called not my loved one. I will say to those called not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Isaiah 62, 2, very similar. The nations will see your vindication and all your kings, your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow upon you. Okay, if you hadn't called anything else, what's that new name? Church Christian. That's the new name. Because the people of Israel, God's chosen nation, rejected their Messiah. You and I say we're Christians, say we're a church, the body of Christ. If others viewed us, if Jesus came back today, is that what He would say? Because, see, you've been called by a new name, but not only have you been called by a new name, you've been bought with the blood of God's only Son. Do not take that lightly. You are the new people called, united together for a new purpose to be the hands and feet as what we're studying in Sunday school. Jesus continued is the name of the book because Jesus left this earth and put you and I in charge of carrying on His mission and His ministry to a world who will die and go to hell without the saving knowledge that we possess. We do have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. What are you doing with them? I'll remind you about Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 7 again. Maybe you want to jot that one down. Maybe you want to post that one on your doorpost of your house. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways submit to Him and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Last week I took you to the New Testament and tied it together. I'm going to take you right back to the same passage this week. Do you remember what it was? Luke chapter 12. 12. What's in Luke chapter 12? Well, let me tell you one thing that's in Luke chapter 12. Wouldn't you think Solomon, the greatest, wisest, most honored, wealthiest person who ever lived, king of all kings up until Jesus Christ, wouldn't you think he'd be mentioned a lot in the New Testament? Five times. That's it. Five times. One says Solomon actually built the temple instead of David in Acts. Oh, whoop-de-doo. Two of them are really referring to the Queen of Sheba, 
And they're really referring to those at Judgment Day who in the cities that Jesus visited did not accept him. Okay? And then two of them are this. One of them is found in Luke chapter 12. Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, whenever you see that, that means listen up. <laughs> listen up. Jesus is speaking. Not even Solomon in all of his splendor are dressed like one of these. Not even the greatest person who ever lived prior to Jesus can be compared to a wildflower. Wildflower, not one that grows in your garden that you plant or anything. One that just pops up. You had nothing to do with it. And you say, my, how beautiful. And God was totally in control of this thing. You had nothing to do with it because your life is but a mist, a vapor. How are you going to live that? If God clothes the wild flowers in such beauty, maybe you should consider them <laughs> before you consider any man in following his ways. There's only one man that you can follow, Jesus Christ, the God-man. Isn't that something that that's the only scripture? And those are words in red only. That's the only scripture about the greatest fool <laughs> who ever lived. Now, he's got plenty of wise things to say, and we can learn from his example. And you, you may get offended for me saying he's the greatest fool, but I'm looking at what he did, and I'm trying my best to learn from it and take his words and pattern my life after Jesus. In Luke 12, verse 29, if we read on, it says, this is after you've considered the wildflower over Solomon. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. It doesn't say set your heart on the treasures that Solomon chased. It says don't even set your heart on what you'll eat or drink. Don't worry about it. Really? Have you missed the whole point? Are you that much more blind than the biggest fool who ever lived? God's the one that provides what you eat and what you drink. It's all because of Him. If He takes His hand away from this creation, which He won't because His Word says He won't, we know, we know that Jesus Christ didn't die in vain. But He's the one that gives you what you eat or drink. Do not worry about them. Verse 30, For that's what the pagan world runs after. Not you. Not you or if you're my disciple. You know that your life is a blessing from God. It's but a vapor. Live it to bring Him glory and honor. And, in verse 30, your father knows what, that you need them. What good father is not going to provide them? I could ask the children here, do you worry about what you eat or drink? You might say, I want this or that to drink as a child, but you don't worry about where the meal's coming from. Not even if times are hard. You know that dad will provide. Might not be what I wanted. That's about me again. But Dad will provide. I will be nourished. I will be fed. Then there's verse 31. There's a but. <laughs> I love them. Here's what you should do. Seek His kingdom. <laughs> and here's the promise. And all these things will be added to you also. Wow, what a God we have. That He would love us enough to give us His Son and would tell us if we are obedient and follow after Him, <laughs> He'll give us blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. Go home and read Luke chapter 12 from beginning to end. It starts with Jesus talking about the Pharisees because great crowds have gathered around. Just like great crowds have come from all over the world to hear King Solomon's wisdom, people crowded around Jesus to see if He truly was the Messiah or not. And the first thing he directed was don't follow after the Pharisees. Yeah, I'm calling us Pharisees. I'll point them back this way. Because many times we can quote the Scripture, but we don't live it. Love your enemies. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Don't let the sun go down on my anger. Did I hit a nail with any of those? I can go on. I hit myself. And Jesus reminds us to fear the Lord in, in verse 4. 
I tell you, my friends, after he tells the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after them you can do more. Because see, I'm worried about what you guys think about me or what you might do to me. But I don't need to worry about that. I need to fear the Lord and preach the word. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after can do nothing. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after the body has been killed has authority to throw you in hell. Then you get that again. Listen up. Yes, I tell you. If you didn't catch it the first time, here's the second one. Fear him. If you read on, it happens to be a parable <laughs> about a rich fool. Maybe Jesus meant Solomon. Because after he says, consider the wildflowers instead of Solomon, that's what follows after this. But that parable says this. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself... He didn't acknowledge the Lord in his path, but he thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I will do. Get it? This is what I think. This is what I'm going to do. My will, my way. I don't see that as scriptural, but I see it as something I do constantly. Okay? This is what I will do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I, 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 I will do. But <laughs> God, who it's all about, including your life, especially your life, God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. He has authority to take your life. And he has authority to throw your soul into hell for all eternity. You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared yourself for. Let me give you another scripture again. Two of them. All have sinned and fall short of God's glorious standard. And the wages of sin is death. I'm not stopping there, though, because there's a but. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 21, This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. This week, if you're reading along, please read. If you're not, please start. You will see that God rips the kingdom of Israel apart. That He takes down Solomon through other people because Solomon did not follow in the ways of righteousness. Vanity, vanity, vanity. Hevel, hevel, hevel. Foolishness, foolishness, foolishness. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Whatever words you want to put there, because what it is is not translated well. It's vapor, vapor, vapor. Miss, miss, miss. Breath, breath, breath. Because you've got to understand that the one who wrote this, probably Solomon, said, The life I have lived, I now understand from this wisdom, it's but a breath, and I just let it escape. I chased after the wrong thing. I did not acknowledge him in all of my ways. Please learn from the teacher. That's what Ecclesiastes says. The scripture that Mer Merle says this morning, he even got to the point where he says, well, let me, let me see about folly versus wisdom. And I don't see a real difference because I look at this world and I see that good things happen to good people, bad things happen to good people. I see the same thing with wicked people. Good things happen to them. In fact, I, I want to see that I see this more because it's just what we want to see. And bad things happen to wicked people. But we're all accountable for the mist called our life. So he says, please, please, please learn from me. Hevel, hevel, hevel. You know when the first use of the word was? It's used 37 times, I think, in Ecclesiastes. But the very first use is in Genesis chapter 4. Eve gave birth to a son and named him Abel. That's Hevel with a capital H. Did you know that? He's the one whose life but was for a mist because his own brother killed him, snuffed out his life early. What? Where were you, God? He was right there. And the New Testament tells us that his blood screams out. So does Jesus Christ's blood. 
It screams out from the cross. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow after me. The very first use was the very second child born that the first child murdered whose life but was a mist. Ecclesiastes ends this way. In chapter 12, starting in verse 8, we'll just use the meaningless one because it's a translation I have. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Don't take that wrong because it's to get you to think that all these things are meaningless. But there's one, one thing that's not. Our glorious God who gives life and takes away life. Who gives eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. Verse 9, not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted, imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words. And he wrote, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goad, goads. They collected their collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. I'm going to repeat that one. Verily, verily, I will repeat it. Firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Okay? Verse 12. Be warned, my son, of any addition to them. Or making books, of making books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. I told you I could have stopped there this morning. We just got there again. For this is the duty of all mankind. All mankind, not just a Christian, but all mankind. How much more is it the duty and responsibility of a Christian? The one who wears a new name, and that name is Christ Jesus. How much more does the blood of Jesus Christ cry out to the one who took the nails from you? They were firmly embedded in his hands or wrists, his feet or ankle, wherever you want to place them. They were taken from you for all eternity if you will put your trust in him. So today's your decision whether things are going to be meaningless, 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 or if you're going to live, live, live. If you're going to follow Jesus, follow Jesus, follow Jesus. If you're going to trust him, trust him, trust him. If you're going to fear God, fear God, fear God, and obey God, obey God, obey God, the choice is yours. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the words of Solomon. We thank you for his example. We thank you for this word that you have given us, the word that became flesh and dwells among us, the word that was in the beginning, the word that will be there in the end. We thank you for your word and for those that have chosen to read it and study it and devour it and for hunger and thirst for righteousness. And for those that haven't, Lord, I pray today that you will convict their hearts to read your word, to study it, not to live on food alone and not to even worry about those things, but to live off the word of God. I thank you for each and every one here. I thank you that we are the body of Christ that we may let our light shine before men, that they may see our good works and glorify you, O gracious Heavenly Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.